time travel. One of my favorite subjects. When I was a kid. Okay, not when I was a kid. At some point, I said, time travel is so freaking cool. Then I started getting scared. What if people could go back in time? What if I was walking around walking to me? Maybe, maybe there. Maybe there. Then I began to think, hmm, time travel. How the hell can you go back in time? Now there's a very interesting theory. A proof that it can't be done. Well, somebody, you really can't prove it, can you? Well, no, okay, let's just say, here's the problem. The Earth is spinning. Okay, if you want to go back in time, you have to spin the Earth backwards. How much energy does it take to spin the Earth backwards? A lot. Not only is the Earth spinning, it's rotating around the sun. Right? A lot. Right. The Earth is going out and back, out and back. Okay, so you got problem one, problem two, now I'm going to give you problem three. Now this one, I'm going to the sun is orbiting the Milky Way. Yeah, and you guessed it. It gets even worse than that. The Milky Way is moving too. Away from the center of the universe. Far away from like who you think it is. Right? Because, never mind, we won't go down that road. Talk to Neil about that. Anyhow, everything is just fucking moving. So to go back in time, you would have to push everything back to where it was at that particular point in time. Now, there's a good news to this story, but I wanted to get the bad news out of the way first, because that is really unlikely. Now, here's an interesting thing. Wormholes. Now, my understanding of wormholes, and some physicists will point out that I don't understand what the fuck I'm talking about, but it seems to be that problem in wormholes. Yeah, wormholes exist, how big they can get, how long you can stretch them, this sort of thing, all cool. Um, let's say you could stretch one to Alpha Centauri and back to Earth. Therefore, you could get to Alpha Centauri instantly. Now, the reason that I point this out is that time travel? Because to go instantly from Earth to Alpha Centauri would mean you traveled through four years of time. You went back in time four years. So if you see something happening in Alpha Centauri, you can go there to that point that you actually see that happening. But actually, the light that you were observing took four years to get to. This is the basic idea of how a wormhole works. So the time you're traveling through time to go through a wormhole. Now whether you can use this wormhole to go through, I don't really care. I'm just looking at a theoretic. If wormholes exist, and physicists say they exist, I say, okay, fine, they exist, but now I have to deal with it philosophically. Okay, if it exists, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't violate the whole thing about moving the whole planet around, because in a sense, you are already there. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I haven't really dealt with that very well. And that brings in the feedback process. Can you really keep a wormhole open? Or does the feedback begin to go back and forth along the wormhole? We don't know. Because it's kind of like putting a microphone, that's the feedback process. And the same thing would happen in a wormhole. Maybe if the wormhole were far enough apart, it would work. Don't know. But one thing we do know is the wormhole has to be in place first before that four year time travel. And the increment would be continuous, meaning every minute that goes by in Alpha Centauri, a minute goes by on Earth. And you couldn't go back. Once that initial jump, you can come back to Earth and it'll be the same time that you left. You wouldn't be able to go back in time. You could go to Alpha Centauri for four years, get into the past, and then come back and you'd be back in the present. And there'd be no time difference. You wouldn't have to deal with the time problem. And this is the thing they're basically in the same time space. Actually, let me tell you, well, no, you are going through, you've seen four years. However, if you know something's going to occur, in one sense it already has occurred, so you can go back through and make it into going through. Anyways, wormholes are a little different, and they're sort of a workaround for time travel. But they create different problems if they're not really time travel, they're wormholes, and they're really about warping space. And you can't really warp space without warping time. Okay, so that's time travel 101, how it might work. Um, not that. But, information theory. What is it like? What is it about time travel that's so friggin' cool? It's about having information. So I'm gonna suggest to you something that will blow your mind. We have time travel third time travelers among us now. Yes, we do. And you are probably one of them. Though you don't realize you're doing it. Time travel is taking information that's gonna be in the future. You see where I'm going? Probably not. You have information of the future. So a good example of having information of the future is if you're playing Mario. Playing video games. You have information of what's going to happen in that video game. And because you died before in a particular place, you know what to expect. Five dollars. Okay, bad example, I know. You're going to hate me because I always come up with bad examples. But the idea that informational systems allow you to do anything you want in terms of a temple. I like the term temple space. I got it from, of course, Star Trek, which I first heard it from. I believe it was first used in Next Gen Generation. I could be wrong. But the idea of temple space is that we experience, we have it through our cognitive space. 
So if we are carrying information, we can cut and paste our knowledge. But here's the idea. If your universe is an informational universe, you can time travel. So this is an interesting thing. If you need to time travel, just ask them where you came from, find as much as you can, and you can probably determine whether or not we live in an informational universe. But that would be a phenomenon that I would say would be reserved for an informational system. So if we live in an informational universe already, then time travel is, is relatively trivial. It's a matter of saving your current state, reloading your old state, and moving forward with time. Saving your state. Now, no, 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 I, I wanted to bring this up because I'm sort of in that thing. With digital things, you digital copy and paste, and you can save an old copy, run the old system, go to an old version, and then rewrite it. Or whatever. We do this all the time in the digital. It's a part of how our brain works. And it's part of the reason why we like time travel is it gets passed on to something. Like, I just don't think I know. Could we do that? So, that's what we like about time travel. Hey, can we do it? Whoa! With the knowledge of why that was a bad choice. Unfortunately, it's hard to believe it's a physical world we live in. If it turns out that we don't live in a physical world, well, time travel would be easy. Who has that remote? theory of time travel. So what we like about time travel is that we can go and undo things we did, or we can plan something in the past that will grow into the future, right? Go and uh, take some gold coins or buy some stocks. You know, you, you get the basic picture. If I had that knowledge, I could buy those stocks and I'd be a gazillionaire. Okay. Planning of knowledge. You know how the future's going to look by that. Now, and in terms of this theory, an information theory, if we can go back in time, but then we go back to the future, we have two choices. We can take a parallel path, and we can go back to a future, but that future will not have the speed that we followed. Right? It will be the present future, because it's a copy. It has not progressed through. It still needs to progress through the year. Let's say you go back a year. You're going to buy stocks. Now, you need a year to transpire. That transaction, what the ripple effect of that transaction needs to be propagated through the year that you want to go through. Now, I'm not saying this very well. I should use visual aids and all that good stuff, but, but, you know, I'm not sure how I'm going to say this. So here's the deal. Back in time. So we plant a seed, we buy a stock, it has to propagate. It takes time to go through. Now, when you're talking about a computer system, now you can run that computer system back in time. Or, because you're informational, you can just take a break. And wake up in a year. Ha! There it is! Back to where I was before. With the speeds of change. Remember the problem about stopping the world from making people back in time from getting that chunk of gold? I want you to think about that for a second. The complexity of the world will determine how practical doing something like that is. But, we will, as a species, probably, in my opinion, will probably do things very similar to this, because as we're trying to explore alternative systems, what would have happened if Hitler had won, for example? It's a silly one. Everyone uses it because they're like, what if he won? What would the world look like? And I'm sure someone in the future will probably say, yeah, I don't know what it would be like. Let's take a simulation of Earth 1946, and we'll run through the couple of last years of the war, and then just progress it out 10 years. Now, there are moral and ethical issues to some of this stuff, and we won't worry about that for now. In some computational sense, we could do this, and maybe even have real people, or at least people that behave very much like they would have had these events occurred. Um, but it's going to be an alternative history. It's not going to be a real history. Um, it won't have the same texture. Well, it could, in theory, have a very similar texture. But it won't have a complete exact, because we don't have all the information we need to build that, because we don't have the brains. Brains are probably one of the most complicated units that we have in existence right now, uh, that are naturally occurring. Brains are measurably complex systems. And because they are measurably complex, we can't reproduce them and expect to have them do any function, anything in the wide safe way. Now, which brings up interesting points about, do brains, how similar is one brain to another brain? Meaning, could I acquire your memory as a software update, by a software patch? I mean, how compatible are our brains? How would we recognize information and structures in each other's brains? Now, on, on first blush, you'd say that's just a crazy notion. Why would you do it? How would you do it? Um, Chris Wells and others just sort of take it on faith that it would be doable. Now, the problem with it is, because of our way our brain works, um, it, you know, it generates itself. It, it's a generating system. It's, it's a function that just creates neurons and does brain-generating things. There's every reason to believe they're very similar, because ultimately when you look at the brain, people um, put their speech in the same place, but if they have brain injury, their speech can move to another location because of the concept of plasticity of the brain. So, by default, our brains were wired to a certain way, which suggests that it's probably, our brains are probably very compatible with each other at some level. How compatible is an open question. 
and that's going to do a lot of bringing you to where we really never want to go. Um, there's a possibility that it will, but but it also is because of our experience right directly into our brain, it creates a rather interesting framework of dependency. And the framework of dependency from one brain to another would be fundamentally different. I don't know how they could be the same. Even though, even if we are identical twins, if we had a different, even a different perspective, it would create a relatively um, off-centered uh, pattern. Even if it was a similar looking pattern, it would be, the web would be slightly different. It would be very hard to mesh those two webs together. Now, why that interests me? It's just because it's interesting. So, merging people's ideas together may pose an interesting problem. And the problem is sort of where do we, why do we need to do it? Well, we don't, but it's good for statistical models whether or not we want to create people back in another time frame, right? Because if we want to know how people are thinking, how people behave, the more similar they are, the closer to that reality we can generate, the sooner. Now, there's ways of generating um, informational realities and know you're getting close by observing the events in that reality. So this is how you determine whether or not you got it right. You have a newspaper of a particular time, in 1945, and you want to know what would happen. 1945. Sorry, I'm not saying this up right. So you go back in time. No, you don't go back in time. You create a time series in 1944. And you want to know if you created it right. So you run it forward one year. And then you take information from the real world and you compare it to your simulated world. And if they're similar or the same, you've done a very good job. And you've recreated the pattern. That's how you know whether or not your model is working. Because we have data today. Now to do that, and it's probably not going to be something within our capability anytime soon. But the theory of doing that is real. So, that type, but even if it's not perfect, in fact, it, we're assuming it's not going to be perfect, there's going to be very interesting results that we can generate in terms of even both of history. How would have history unfolded? We might be able to look at that. And, how, and this could be influential in terms of understanding how communication affects society. See, one thing that I really deal with is this era, this very interesting era that we've all been born into and we go, oh, here we are. Well, I didn't ask for that. How the hell did I get here? Who put the on switch for me? Man, I don't want to be here. I want to be back then. I want to be up there. But we're here we are right now. How do we communicate with each other? All of you. We have that capacity. And that is amazing. Amazing. I don't know who's the guy that wrote that. Amazing. It is amazing. We have a global internet. And this internet communicate with the entire world. Over a billion people use YouTube. That is three times the number of people in the United States. That's a lot of people. It's just a fraction, still, of the entire population of the world. But it's a large fraction, and that's impressive in and of itself. YouTube is a reality in and of itself. It's not time traveling. But we are planting seeds for the future. We are planting our ideas for the future. So, I want to get here. I want to get likes. I want to get subscribers. I want to get these things. But there's also another reason that I do it. I do it for the future. For my time traveling self, for my, my person in the future, whoever that person is, is like, oh yeah, hey Mark, I'll bring you into the future. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'm just kidding. But, how do you communicate with the future? You can't really. You do. I mean, we do. When we write something down or we make something, we're communicating in maybe with something that we're writing now. Or we may be communicating with people in the future. Why would you want to do that? Well, because we have many interests about our present. And we have many concerns about our future. We, as a species, have one species on this planet. Let's not forget that. And if you see Mr. Singularity, entity, whatever you are, I know that I am just but one human. So be kind to me and be forgiving to me for all my pissed off, whatever it is. Did you see this Michael Edwards video this morning? He seems pissed off. He just keeps getting singular. Ray Kurzweil makes a lot of jokes, very subtle jokes about this. And I was like, first one's really pissed out of it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. Well, one of them was, well, we haven't created God yet. Or, how about we think we might as well? Other things really pissed me off. Yeah. Singularity is an interesting concept. That we are going to influence you and me. YouTube is going to have a huge influence on singularity. If I'm a singularity, I'm really great, or I'm a singularity, I'm going to go, who do these humans think? What do they want? 
What do they do? What do they think? Do they know anything about me? Have they ever thought about me? Is this true? Huh. What did they say about me? Hi, Sphinx Trinity. How are you doing? Yeah, my name's Mark Chipmunk. Remember me? Can't see that, can you? Um, that's the thing. You can do that. So you can talk to the future. In that future, you might have an impact on me. It is an interesting thing to think about. It is important. Don't think about it. Maybe. Maybe it is important. But I think planning for the future, making sure there is a future, should be important. I, I think it should be a part of our ethic. I want there to be a future. I want there to be a future for everyone. I don't want anyone to die. I don't need anyone to die. I don't need anyone to go away. I want everyone just to think to have a future. That's a positive thing. Even if I don't agree with someone's philosophy, the one thing that scares me the most is when they say we don't have a future, or our future is in heaven. You, sir, if you believe that, you, ma'am, if you believe that, you are a scary motherfucker. Because that means your investment in my world is not here. Your investment is something else. Something else that I would say does not exist. Heaven does not exist. People that die are dead. I'm sorry. I wish there was something we could do. But we don't yet live in an informational universe that we can control. But if you work with me and you work with other like-minded people, we can create a future where people don't have to die. Death is by choice and choice alone. The choice is yours. We don't have to assume that we don't have a future. And to assume that we don't have a future before we've really even started is a tragedy of immense proportions. And so when I think about the future, and I think about time travel, I think in terms that are real. My words will travel into the future, whether I live or die. That is important to me. It may not be important to anyone else. But at least I will have given them the opportunity to care. Give me the opportunity to care. I care. You should care too. We should all care. I care about the truth. I care about the truth so much that I'm willing to sacrifice my immortal soul for the truth. It's kind of crazy. But what I mean by that is, if a god does exist, like a Deo, Christian god, or Muslim god, or Buddhist god, a god, polytheist, right? Hindus are polytheists? Anyway, that's me. If any of these gods actually exist, and then I didn't do something for them that I was supposed to do, because to do for them will show them how much I love them. I'm not being mean, get this. I'm not. Yes, I am. I mean, I am. This is YouTube. Nobody listens to YouTube. The world does not revolve around YouTube. Now, I'm going a bit crazy here. Because I'm crazy. How do I know I don't have a tingling in my hand? We don't know. Ultimately, reality, we don't know the actual underlying rules of reality. There are many possibilities. Many things are on the table that are possible. So when people argue about, I know what the truth is, they don't. I don't know what the truth is. I want to know. I don't want to waste my time on things that can't possibly be true. If I could prove to my satisfaction that singularity could not occur, I wouldn't believe it. I'd say, let's waste our time. Let me find something else. And to be fair, I don't really care that much about singularity. What I believe in is that we have an amazing future if we want it, if we care about it, and if we care enough to want to understand it. If I'm anything, I'm a future. But that's a credential that I have earned. I listen to futurists because they care about the future. They're trying to project into the future. When someone tells me, like, Al Gore, Al Gore is, I'm going to pick on his ass because his ass needs to be picked on. He's kind of stupid. No, he's not stupid. He just doesn't get it. Now, to be fair to him, he wrote a book about this. And he keeps talking about climate. Climate, this, climate, that. I know, I know, I know. Big fucking deal. We can't really do anything about it. Or we are doing things about it. Just knowing about it, I can't look at it. But don't over-fucking react to it. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not denying climate change. It's occurring. Okay, whatever. It's not that interesting. And it doesn't really, it shouldn't affect policy that much. Because ultimately, the solutions for climate change are going to be technology. So you need to understand how technology is going to get us out of our problems. Policy can influence technology, but it might be influencing technology in negative ways. Really investigating and really understanding what technologies will work and what technologies won't work is pretty important. 
but you need to diversify in such a way that you are developing a lot of different technologies and seeing where they can go and not squashing them before they get a chance to take off. And that is more critical than whether or not there's climate change. It's just, eh, may or may not happen. Eh, quality of life does not have to go down. Quality of life can still go up, but you've got to invest in technology because technology is our only solution out of this. We can't go back. There was no solution in, in the past. It does not exist. There are too many people in the world for the old technology, but there aren't too many people in the world for newer technologies. We know that these technologies can come into existence. And so when I talk about the future, I, people say, well, living forever is bad. Well, bad only if you're biological. If you're a computer, what the fuck does it matter if you still exist? If I'm just an algorithm, you can turn me off for a while as I'm taking up too much power. You can turn me back on when you got a little extra power. I, I'll be that guy, okay? I'll, I'll take one for the team. I'll take a couple years off. And you can just power me back up. <laughs> there he is. Hi, there's, there's me on. I have a strange way of looking at it. But it's the right way to look at it. Okay. Yeah. Don't get it. No. Anyway. I watch too many people. People get away with amazing things. It works for them, but it works for me. I just die. The most vilified internet personality. I can read. <laughs> yeah. That's not something I strive for, truly. Though it feels like it right now. Why do I insist on talking about the future? Why is it important? It's, it's an appreciation of technology, but I've grown to appreciate engineering more as a discipline of thought. Eric Dressler is one of my heroes. I appreciate his sincerity, and I appreciate his dedication to engineering. Now, I'm not an engineer by trade. I'm an engineer by institution. I have too many engineers around me not to be considered engineering. But, principally, we have not looked at engineering as a discipline separate from science. I think it's important we realize that many of the problems that we have are not truly scientific problems. They're engineering problems. And one of those problems that I think is really interesting, and Dressler, though his intent was not about social commentary or ethics, but ethics is an engineering problem. It's not a science problem. Now, to get the problem correct, Dressler, we don't need God to create ethics. Evolution created a set of working methods, and I think you can go and you can see what those working methods and what they are and how they work. They are working ethics. And writing sentiments, philosophical sentiments, reflect what I would call a basic core value system. Some of those values are reflected in such ideas as the golden rule, do unto the others as you would have them do unto you. But if you think about it, it makes sense from an evolutionary point of view as well. Trust. If I know you will do for me as I would do for you, then I can, in a sense, have a trust for you. There, we have a bond that we will all for one and one for all. We have a bond. It brings a social structure together. Do for me as I would do for you. And when we reciprocate on that channel of mutual agreement, then our society grows. And because we are a social animal and because of our advantage as being a social animal, being able to work together is so important in the past and in our future. That's where ethics comes from. It's a social bond. It's really, when we talk about ethics, we're talking about social bonds. When we talk about the difference between ethics and law, for example, we're saying how law is not performing a social function that it should. Maybe it can. I'm not clear on that, to be honest with you. But I do believe we should separate the two. Why are laws not necessarily conforming to our social standards? Shouldn't laws reflect our social sensibilities? And when they can't, why can't they? We need to be very clear about that. Like, for example, one of the principles of punishment, punishing somebody like Jesus. It's not that I necessarily have a problem with punishing someone, but I just don't want to pay for it. Punishing someone does nothing for me, and does nothing for society, I'll tell you. Corrective. Punishment is a deterrent, and I accept it. It is a deterrent. It, it will prevent good people from doing bad. To what extent? We need to ask. We need to be careful. Can we get to a point in society where we can look at something like punishment and say, well, he deserves it, and realize, but does he deserve it? When you punish someone, it costs money to punish them, A. It doesn't undo, if you murder somebody, or somebody murders somebody, it doesn't bring them back to life. In the future, they have to do that. They'll go to a backup. They'll lose a day. That's it. But, that's my point to be made, though. If you murder somebody, they're dead, they're gone. We can't bring them back. What does punishment do? Really? I'm not being mean. I don't, I care about the person that died. Don't think I don't care about the person that died. I do. But I know, and you know too, if you ask yourself honestly, punish this guy, this guy comes back. 
and got half. I wish it would, but it ain't got half. And, and he's getting that from her. Okay, so what is it that I really care about? Okay, I don't think I gave him a guess. Now, let me look at the one in my pocket. The reason we don't want something to profit from is more than punishment. It's not really a punishment issue. It's encouragement for someone else to commit that crime. See, if they know they can commit the crime and profit from it, even after they've been convicted, convicted of it, that is a bad message. A really bad message. And that's something we're talking about. Bad message. Not good. Not good at all. You need to put him in jail. Why? It's serious. It's serious. Yeah, but the problem is, and I accept it. The problem we have with that, we should have. We should have had a way better way to punish him. The problem is, we set ourselves up for it. Because we don't have regulation. Well, who should be punished? Yeah, okay. You know where I'm going with that. It's a big problem. And we need to really address it. But punishing people won't address the problem. Because that ain't gonna go away by just punishing someone. Because someone else will do it. So that's what I mean. In the banking, we see it. We understand it because it's too big to fail. We fucked up. We put too many eggs in one basket. We let everything fall apart. Now you're gonna say, but it's all over the fucking map. Everything is related. Everything is related to everything else. That's the six-year-old in Japan speaking to you. I see things in terms of how they relate to each other. And I don't see anything as being totally separate. Which is a bad, right? It's kind of bad. You really want to compartmentalize things a little bit here. But I want to sort of bring other things in to show you that they are related. And our future is related to our present. What is our present? The best way, yes. The best way to predict the future is to create it. That is an engineering that is a position you need to think in terms of walk, in terms of ethics, in terms of rational. We have created. It's not about what was. It is about what can be. What about the past tells us what can be? That's how you use history. You don't use history as a means to tell you the way it should be. No. The way it should be is the way you want it to be. It can be engineered if you accept responsibility for the way things are, not the way you would like them to be. This is the frustration that everything we get tainted by religious thinking. Every aspect of our lives gets tainted. I was told the contrary. I was coaching that it wasn't important, that belief, religion, it wasn't really important to the culture. It changed. It wasn't important to the problem. It wasn't important. I was hoping for that because it makes it a hell of a lot easier. I don't want to change religions. I don't want to, I don't give a shit if a religion that someone believes something. But unfortunately, I have to change. Because their beliefs affect what they do. They affect our reality now. So, why are you atheist? I guess, for lack of a better word, I'm an atheist. But I don't care about atheism. What I care about is getting shit done. Getting good shit done. The engineering problem. How do we make the world better? We can't make the world better when people can't communicate honestly. Now, Sam Harris goes crazy on communication. He even wrote a book about lying. How you shouldn't lie. Not even a white lie. You really need to justify that lie. Not even a white lie. Okay. He doesn't believe in white lies. So you need to be honest. You need to do everything you can to be honest. Even if it puts you in an awkward position. And it's a really important point for that. And it's an important point if you want to take ethically. If I believe this is true, I need to demonstrate it all the time. But he could be an ass. And I call him out on that and no one cares. That's okay. That's okay. I guess that's, I don't care. That's not important. It's just a nice lie. You need to think about ethics. But wouldn't you rather you be nitpicky? You think you let people get away with it? Certainly it's a small, minor infraction, as infractions go. But deep to the heart of a video, they count. And this is my position. I don't care about religion. I am okay with being followed in the drama code. I don't really give any stock to the word. And I wish other people would just simply brush it aside as hmm, rhetoric. Or better yet, uh, yeah, I'm an Islamophobe. And that's okay. You should be an Islamophobe too, because those people are nice. You should be afraid of them. Afraid of them. Now, that's not necessarily meaning that they're dangerous. As an individual person, they may not be dangerous. But they are a carrier for an idea. And this idea that a person can be a carrier for an idea. I'm a carrier for many ideas. Some ideas are probably scary to many people. Some of them are scary to me. But I am a carrier of ideas. And I project these ideas in various ways. So, when you attack an idea, and this is a frustrating thing to anyone, that attacks religion, is you're not attacking the people or interested in religion, you're attacking the ideas that they carry in their heads. Those ideas are dangerous. They're dangerous to you, they're dangerous to everyone else. 
and you are acting on those behaviors because you are their belief because you think they're real. They're not. I'm not going to prove it now. Our people will prove it for me. But let me just tell you how I see them. They are not true. I can argue with anybody. I can take anybody at any time, opportunity, and let's go for it. If you want to prove to me that something is true that I say fundamentally is not true, I'm okay with that. Emotionally, I understand your need to prove to me that your beliefs are real. I understand that. I'm okay with that. I've spent my entire life being okay with that. Okay? Communication is everything. When I study philosophy at the University of Washington, Eastern Washington University, as I call it, sorry, it's a brain fart joke, but one of the classes I took was on ethics. And I got an opportunity to read the current crop of books on ethics that the philosophy instructor wants his students to read. He says, these are books I don't have time to read. Read them for me. Give me a book report. Huh? It's a good idea, really. Think about it. You want to guys give me? He trusted us. He goes, oh, you guys have good minds. And I can ask you questions, and I have to go back to the ideas, and we can sort of hash it out. But it was a good exercise to put us through how to analyze reading a book. But one of the main themes that stuck with me, and it stuck with me as, as I said, it's the idea of dialogue and the importance of dialogue. In the future, you're going to be a different person. So making yourself in the future do something that your previous self told you to do is that ethical. Are you free? Now, don't take go too far on that. It just took us to a point in time. But the realization that you need to be able, free, to be able to make decisions. And not to be told what to do, but to be given the tools to decide the best course of action. That is dialogue. When an atheist, I say, a good atheist, and this is, I'll define a good atheist for you, or someone who's an active anti-theist. The reason they are anti-theistic is because you are making decisions based on someone else's beliefs. They're not really your beliefs. You behave as if they are your beliefs because you have emotionally attached to them. But few people that believe in God, and there are some that do, believe in the rhetoric. They more or less accept it as a part of them, but they don't understand the true implications of that rhetoric. And it's a problem. And releasing people from that rhetoric, saying, look, you can't take it on faith. You can't. Because you're enslaving yourself. You're enslaving your mind to something that you don't understand. You're going to make decisions based on something that can't possibly help you in a given situation. Well, that's not entirely true. There are situations where it may accidentally help you. It's kind of like the idea that if I don't put my seatbelt on, I could be in an accident where if I had my seatbelt on, I would have died. Yeah. Yeah, there are accidents. There's a certain percent of accidents that because you're wearing your seatbelt, you'll die. And if you've not been wearing your seatbelt, you would have lived. That's kind of fucked up, right? But, here's the but part. The majority of the time, it's going to save your life. If you're in an accident where you could die. Anyway, so you can see what I'm saying. The argument that it does exist, an opportunity where a behavior will work for you. You have to ask, will it work for you all the time? Some of the time? Most of the time? How effective is it? Now, I'm a very outcome-oriented belief person. Yeah. So I don't really, I mean, just what are the results of believing this? How does it work in reality? Do you need one thing for the other? So, for example, can you meditate without believing in God? Can you pray? Go through the act of praying without believing in God. Prayer is good for the prayer, but does nothing for anyone else. And that's okay, right? It's good for the person that prays. So, go ahead, pray. Pray for yourself. Because that's really who you're praying for, regardless of who you think you're praying for. You're praying for yourself. That is effective prayer. And taking time to say grace may be good for you. I'm okay with that. I don't need to change that about my behavior. What I do need to explain to you is the woman's right to choose. Now, I understand. Life is important. And I think we should all value life dearly. But preventing a woman from choosing to be a parent or not to be a parent when it's appropriate. I mean, we have to define what appropriate is, but truly, it benefits society by giving a woman that right. Now, it's not a right that I want to give to a man. Now, if the woman chooses to offer a part of, hey, do you want to have a baby? I mean, would you want to be a parent with me? If there's that kind of discussion, that's her choice. And, and in a sense, I would say this to a woman that's trying to make a choice. The choice is yours. I know it's not fair, but the choice is yours. Not someone else's. How do you feel? There are agencies that will help you have a child if you want. There are agencies that will help you with that child if you're not. Okay? But it's your choice. 
And the reason I make it your choice is because I want to empower you to be whoever you want to be. I do not want you to saddle with the guilt of giving up this potential life. Please do not saddle yourself with this guilt. It's not worth it. Every day is life is lost. This is not a life that we need to worry about. You, if you want to cherish your life, cherish your own life first. So that you can grow and be happy for someone else and you really can spend the benefit of you and make your direction easier, something you want to invest in, then it's yours. But I do recommend talking to yourself first about this. Especially if you want to do that. Do you really know what it entails to do that? Are you really seriously thinking about it? Because parenting is so, 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 they need to use more pictures. It's worth it. We can't take parenting lightly. Pro-choice is pro-parenting. Are you going to be a good parent? Now, no one knows. No, really. Yet everyone knows you are. But being honest with yourself and being honest with everyone around you is fundamentally more important than many of the things that you will hear. I realized, for me, that life isn't a sport. How do you celebrate life? Is it by forcing someone to become a parent? It's about valuing the life we have, not the life we give up. And I say potential life. A zygote, a barely formed fetus, is beginning. We don't have it. The community doesn't have a lot invested in it. There's not a lot invested in that system. We need to invest in what already exists first, and then if we have extra resources, give it to new life. But then when we do invest in new life, new life is very important. We need to be able to invest fully in that, and then we need to fully commit to that life, not be forced into it. Who wants to have a parent that says to them, you know, I never wanted to be a parent? Well, you could have stopped it. Yeah, there's problems with adoption. There's problems with all of the methods. Abortion's not a, impossible. It's not a wrong option. I, it's just important. For that choice to be a willing one. Now I know that it's the right decision for society to make. There's an emotional component, and that is what I address there. How it's made. I want a woman to feel okay about making that decision. I want them to learn from making that decision. But society benefits from giving women the right to choose. We benefit. Societies that force their women to give birth, or cultures or communities that force women to give birth, are poorer societies are poorer societies. Inadvertently, are inadvertently, I don't know if it was done on purpose, but it does enslave women to their reproductive function. We need women to be full members of society, not a single functional member of society. It devalues women to force them to give birth. And by devaluing women, you devalue society, you devalue life. The very thing that you hold so precious, you're devaluing. People will argue with me, and that's okay. But I have come to an understanding of why I support that position. I didn't always have that belief. I didn't have that position. I was open. Because I understood the idea and the importance of life. And that we need to value life. Because ultimately we are only life. We are one life. One with life. We are infinitely important to ourselves. Because without ourselves, we cannot experience life. So we are. Life is important. But there's a point at which you didn't have to. You didn't know that you were going to give birth. You didn't make the decision. I did not make a conscious choice to give birth. I don't have the capacity to make that choice. My parents had to make that choice for me. It's the ultimate choice that a parent makes. And if my mother said, you will not be, I would not insist on that choice. That was her choice. I'm here because she chose to have me. That's my choice. Your parents chose to have you. My son is here because I chose to have him. But my wife chose to have me. That's a powerful thing, okay? I'm not here. Because someone told me I had to be here. I'm here because someone chose to have me. So I want this child. Here, there you go. To me, that was the most powerful realization. The choice to be a parent. Would you want us to take that away from you? Would you want us to say to that child, we value you so much that we devalue your mother? And if that child you'll have to deal with the same devaluation that she did. No. The investment in time, the investment in society of Lee is a viable female. She's more valuable than that fetus by far. By far. As a general rule. Think about it. You have devalued
overvaluing the mother. By overvaluing the child. We have nothing but hope for this child. Society has, doesn't even know it exists. We have nothing but hope. The idea of social investment is complicated. Only in the sense that we have to evaluate it hierarchically. You can't say that everything is equal. It doesn't work. It's meaningless to say everything is equal. And it's in a binary sense. You can't have information. You can't have meaning without data. This has to change. This means that odds are odd. It can't be both on and on. Unless, of course, it's a quantum zero, which is we're not talking about. It is or it is not. It is equal or it is not equal. At a minimum, we have to make that distinction. If it is equal, if everyone is equal, obviously they are not equal. And you will agree with me, and you probably already do before you even go down that road. People are not fungible. For example, a fungible item would be like a dollar bill. I pull out a dollar bill and say, hey, can I change, can I get your dollar bill to my dollar bill? And they're like, what's with your dollar bill? What's wrong with it? Oh, I don't know, I just want a different one. Oh, okay. So you switch. Interchangeable. Fungible. Boop, boop, boop. One dollar is any other dollar. It's just a marker of money. Okay. People are you fungible. Is your wife as good as my wife? Maybe, but I don't think so. Do you prefer your wife over my wife? But I might prefer your wife. But I'll probably prefer my wife. Got it? Very simple. People are not fungible. That means we cannot say that all people are even equal. They're not. Sorry. It's actually interesting why that is very, very, very true. It's an informational construct. One book is not the same as many books. We know that to be true. But the same book is the same book. That's true. We would exchange the same book. If we wanted that book, maybe we want a different book to exchange one book for a different book. Because we want to exchange one book, but that's different. If people need wife swapping, maybe that would happen too, right? But we're not fungible. Your child is not my child. I'm sorry. I'm sure you love your child very much, but it's not the same. When we equate one life to another life, you can't do it. Not even on a society level can you do it. The president of the United States is not the same as Barry Donald. Well, whose life is more valuable? Oh, well, I guess you think that he's not valuable. But at a society level, he has more value. You can't equate one life to another. They don't work that way. Lives are not lives. They're complicated. They're interconnected with a community, and they have community value. That is how we determine the value of a life. It's how connected they are to the community. If you want to know how valuable you are, the question is how connected you are to the community, and how much do they make. That's your value. If your monetary value is one measure of who you are, but if you want who you are, is truly measured by what you offer to the community. I'm just as valuable as someone else. No, you're not. No, am I. Sorry. I am valuable, infinitely valuable to myself, of course. And we need to value that as individuals. I value the fact that I know that you are infinitely valuable to someone else. And I will protest that. As I would want people to protest that to me. But I'm not going to make choices that hurt other people more. Because I value you a different than someone else. It gets us into trouble. Because we're not equal. And it would be really kind of cool in one sense if we were equal, because then everything would be so mathematically simple. But no, it's not. So, the best thing to do is to try to value all life as much as possible. I recently listened to a debate on giving and the equation argument that I'm talking about here. If I can spend $40,000 and help one person, or I can spend $40,000 and help a thousand people, which should I do? You see my problem with that? People are not fungible. And your choice of who to help can be dependent upon your relationship and their relationship in your community. It's important. It's relevant. So helping a bunch of strangers in another country is not as important as helping my neighbor. Are you okay with that? I'm not saying that helping strangers in another country isn't important, and thank you, Bill Gates, for being that person to help those people. I'm going to let you make those good decisions. You need my help, you have my phone number. Give me a call. I'm there for you. But I know what my neighbor needs. I know what the needs of my community are. I don't really know what the needs of another community are. I can learn about it, I can take time, but my bang for the buck may be a price, it may be a good decision to make, but it's not a simple decision to make. Simply giving to most bang for most buck may not be the best choice for me to make with my giving. Because our communities matter. And we need to have healthy communities. And I need to look at my community, what will help my community the most. So I kind of resent those calculations. But I understand them. And I would 
consider them as a part of the book. But I don't want to consider it the only part of the book. Because life is not a part of the book. Some people are more valuable than me. And I don't want my son to be treated like a box. Anyway. Separation. Who we are as a species. Who we are as a grown man. When we think about what we should do with our lives. How we should do it. Deport ourselves. We need to ask who we are. And the reason we need to ask who we are is so that we know that we're doing what we are, not what somebody says we are, or something that someone says we should be. Because if we can't be honest with ourselves, who can we be honest with? And that's what it boils down to. Back to Sam Harris's book, Why? I've often said, I've often believed, of course, in a sort of a fallacious way, lying to yourself is the worst kind of lie. It's the worst kind of lie. Because it's a fundamental lie. It's a lie that eats you. It's a lie that tears at your heart. If you know it's a lie. Sometimes you don't know it's a lie. Sometimes you believe it. And when you investigate, you find out, oh my goodness, I've been lying to myself. I wanted to believe it to be true, but it's not. Soul searching is a matter of looking for the truth in the nature of the situation. It's a matter of saying, what is it about me that I like? And you know, ultimately, if you don't like yourself, it's very hard to do so. But it is. And these are psychological principles that are well known and well documented, but there's actual reasons behind them. Liking yourself creates an emotion of well-being. That's why it's important that you keep liking yourself. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, or you shouldn't already know. You need to like what you're doing. You need to like what you're doing, because you're getting more bang. Money is a form of voting. I agree with that. That's a principle that some activists like to point out. Money is voting. But it's not the only way to vote. 